Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singers. Let's get biblical Q and A coming to you from the Holy Land, our beloved Rabbi Tobia Singer. Welcome back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Great to have you back, of course, no doubt. Um, yeah. Before we get you know, going, w- yep, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Rabbi. Go ahead. Before we. Before we get going on this uh, topic, just real quick, if you have a, any kind of a good update for us uh, that kind of set all of our minds at ease temporarily, anyway, on those horrible times right now, right now. By the way, for the record, it's November, uh, November fifth, twenty twenty three. If you're watching this later, yeah, I could tell you this: um, this country is very different today than it was one month ago. One month ago. There was a lot of division in this country. There were protests and there were people who were battling each other on the streets over when, where, how to pray. It was it was a challenging time. And um, that's changed quite a bit. There is a, a unity in this country following the genocide of October 7th that I've never seen before. A a single-mindedness. And it's something that's been part of our history. In the past, when the nation of Israel endured great trauma, it transformed us. It's for that reason that we thank God for delivering us from Egypt. The classic question, why would we thank God for delivering us from Egypt? After all, he's the one who put us there in the first place. But we emerge from the Kur HaBarzal, we emerge from bondage, a different kind of nation kind of nation that would would have sensitivity. The nation endured the loss of Yeshiyahu, a great king, killed in battle, had a deep impact on our nation. Uh, many different traumas have affected us and refined us. And in fact, the Torah s- admonishes us to be kind to strangers. It's it's the most frequently repeated commandments to be kind to the ger. Ki ger ha'yisim beretz nashayim, because you too were strangers in the land of Egypt. So this tremendous trauma, and I can report this to you, that everyone in this country is just completely traumatized. Everyone in this country is sitting shiva. Everyone in this country is in a state of mourning. Everyone in this country is shattered. Everyone is. We all are. Um, It's a different kind of country that existed a, a month ago or a year ago. And you might ask the question, did it require this? The answer is, unfortunately, it did. You know, the question I think we're asked very frequently on this show is the suffering, how does it atone for sin? Because, of course, people viewed the Christian doctrine of vicarious atonement with shock. How could the innocent and then anyone innocent die for the sins of the wicked? And they cannot. The Bible says it's not possible, and we would never want that. We would never want to live in a country where guilty people were exonerated and innocent people were punished. It makes no difference where you live. It makes no difference what you're your views are they're liberal or conservative. We really don't want innocent people punished for the behavior of others. But when people endure trauma and 
the trauma of October 7th, that very, very dark day when children were burnt alive in front of their parents, when parents were shackled and burnt alive in front of their children. It's something so horrible that something so horrible you can't it's hard to wrap your head around it but it did affect us the nation as a whole was transformed people are gentler with each other we realize that the issues we bickered over a month ago were really quite silly when I'm in the store and I'm just picking up grapefruits, the man next to me, who I've never met before, opens up a plastic bag for me to, to make it easier for me to collect my produce. People are far more gentle with each other now. And this feature of caring about one another is critical to the redemption after all, Jerusalem could only be redeemed to Tzedek and Mishpat, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 27. It's not Jews eating pork or violating Sabbath, but rather it's the way we deal with the most innocent, the weakest members of society. So that's changed dramatically, and it did require a trauma that's not been known to our people since the Holocaust. In fact, the, in fact, I don't think anyone really has wrapped their head around what's happened, and the trauma continues as as we continue. It's not over. It's so um, that's very much what's going on. As far as the news, you, you can get that. Sure, right. News sources, but that's very much the feeling here in the Holy Land. Very good. Okay, well, Rabbi, thank you for that update. Really appreciate that. I know uh, we're all very happy that you're safe and the people that are associated, yeah. not not seeming selfish, but people, um, a lot of people have, the friends that they have in Israel are you through this channel or through your network. And so, uh, fortunately, so far, everybody's safe, and I'm very grateful for that. So, okay, we'll move right on into this first topic of the day. Let me play this clip. Hi, Rabbi Singer. You said many times that the from the Bible, from Psalm 111, that and other places that the, that the, that the commandments are forever. Therefore, when the church says that we're done away with the law, it doesn't work. At, it doesn't work. So forever and cannot does not always mean forever. We find, for instance, by Hanan, First Samuel chapter one, verse twenty-one, which says that which which Hannah says to God, if you give me a child, she will go to the house of God forever. Now, he was definitely not in Shiloh forever. Shiloh was destroyed. What it means is as long as Shiloh was, existed, um, um, Shmuel would be there. Samuel would be there. Also in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 in the Hebrew Bible, verse 7 in the Christian Bible, it says that, that Hezekiah and Melchizedekiah would rule forever. What does, it, what does it mean forever? You not, definitely do not rule forever. He only ruled for 25 years, you know, um, 29 years. It means as long as Hezekiah ruled, he was, um, as long as he ruled, as long as he was alive, he ruled. So maybe we can say the same thing with the commandments that, that as long as the Torah exists, it's forever. Thank you. That's a really good point. How do you argue that? Yeah. So Christians parrot, regurgitate the teachings of Paul. Paul fiercely opposed the keeping of ritual Torah. Paul insisted, and Paul is, no question, the author of Orthodox lowercase o Christianity. He wasn't the only um, he wasn't the only person who had a view about how Christianity should look, but his views won, 
and those of his opponents, and we know about them because well, Paul wrote about them, they lost. And Paul insisted that the commandments, now this is one distinction that's very important. When Paul insisted that, uh, that God has done away with the law, um, he's referring to... Um, he, he's referring to ritual law. He's not referring to the prohibition of murdering or stealing or none of those things. So Paul did not oppose uh, commandments like thou shalt not steal or murder and so on, but he was fiercely antinomian. He was against ritual law. He insisted, in fact, that the ritual law had no real purpose of its own. And it, the law really was nothing more than a shadow. And the essence is Christ, Colossians 2, verse 17. And therefore, he admonishes his readers not to even consider or let no one tell you about what you eat, what you drink, the festival, you, you, none of that's important because it's all a shadow. And a shadow is nothing. A shadow is the absence of light. Uh, Paul says in, in Galatians 3 that the only reason why there were laws to begin with, like why then give laws, is really only, the law is only a taskmaster. And what he's conveying is that the law never had any meaning, never had any intrinsic meaning or importance. And it was temporal. And its purpose was only to, to inform you that you're a sinner, so then you can become a Christian. You can believe in Jesus. If what I've just said to you sounds odd, sounds strange, sounds contrived, maybe you think I'm, I have an unfavorable view of, of Christianity, so I'm I'm strawmanning this. I'm mischaracterizing the teachings of the church. If you think of that, that means you've never been to church in your life because this is standard fare at every Sunday service and Bible class. Every Christian watching me knows this is exactly what he's been told. Torah, you don't have to keep it anymore. The law has been made a curse for us. And um, Paul says in Romans 7, where he's addressing fellow Jews, that in fact, uh, when he became aware of the law, he knew that he was a sinner. That, that's what awoke him to that. So he had a very unfavorable view of the law. There were other contributing authors to the New Testament that had a different view, like whoever wrote the book of James. I don't know who wrote it. His name probably was James. Who, which James? I have no idea. Yaakov. Uh, not the brother of Jesus, but somebody wrote it. His view was different than Paul. And that's why the book of James was thought of as a, a straw of a gospel in the view of, of Luther, as an example, the first generation of reformers. Well, how do you get around the, how do you get around the problem of the Torah says, the prophets tell us the the Hebrew Bible tells us the Torah is forever. Um, Psalm 111, verse 7 and 8, the Torah is forever. How do you get around that? So you um, just said, well, sometimes in the Bible, and you're going to hear this from Christians, so prepare yourself, that the word forever, la'olam, doesn't necessarily mean forever as eternity, but it means during your lifetime. That's all it means. And therefore, you don't have to keep the ritual commandments forever. This is such a game that Christians play, and it's not one that Christians should be proud of. It's not one that the church should boast of. Because they play a game when they want the word forever to be forever. They translate it that way. They render it that way. And they preach it that way. Micah 5.2 comes to mind. It's really Micah 5.1. Where 
Matthew misquotes it in Matthew 2, verse 6, and tells us, it really is telling us about King David, who came from Bethlehem and is the progenitor of the Mashiach. So there, the Christian translators, that's how the verse ends, render Micah 5, 2 in a Christian Bible, 5, 1 in a Jewish Bible, from eternity, you see. So when they want the word olam to be forever, because they want to convey that Jesus is God and he is deity and he's eternal, then they know how to translate it forever. But when they don't like it, this is exactly, this is precisely how they argue it. And it's a very silly argument, but it's a game of picking and choosing. It's a decision that Christians make that I'm going to worship myself and the religion that makes me feel good, the religion that helps me get rid of my anxieties and my depression, and I'm just going to look for verses that comport, that map onto, that are consistent with what I think my God should look like. I ignore all the others. It's a game of pick and choosing. It's a sin of unequal weights and measurements that every person should flee from, everyone should run from. Now, as it turns out, the most dangerous arguments are those that have a little truth. And this one does have a little truth, and that is that the word olam can mean for a lifetime. You uh, pointed to 1 Samuel chapter 1, I think you said verse 21, it's really verse 22, where Hannah promises God that her son, should she have such a child, would, once he's weaned, she will bring him to to work in the Beis Hamigdosh, in the temple, Olam, forever. Obviously, her son, Shmuel, didn't live forever. In fact, he died in 1 Samuel chapter 25. So it meant a lifetime, right? <laughs> Again, that's that picking and choosing. The example you gave about Isaiah 9, verse 6 or 7 in the Christian Bible is not a good example because in that passage we are told that Chizkiyahu, it's not Chizkiyahu's personal reign that would be forever, but Chizkiyahu who was rescued along with all the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the Assyrian Empire for the full story, see Isaiah 36 and 37, see 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. It would preserve the seat of David with mishpat in the critical words, with justice and righteousness forever. It's the Davidic dynasty that's forever, a promise made in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. If you understand this, you're alive. If you don't, you're walking around in the clouds. You're walking around blind, don't see, have eyes, but not able to see and ears not able to hear. So what is preserved through the rescue of Chizkiyahu is the Davidic house. It's the throne of David. So it's not just Chizkiah who's reign, and he reigned for 29 years, not 25. But that's that's not really important. The, when the Torah used the word l'olam v'ed, l'olam v'ed, then it really means forever and ever. Example, and I think you'll find this valuable. The longest chapter in all of Tanakh, the longest chapter is Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter. What's the chapter about? By the way, the chapter has an acrostic in it, famous. Acrostic means that the passages follow the alphabet. It's a way to make sure that you can you can remember it, right? So as it turns out, the entire chapter, the longest chapter in Tanakh is devoted to what? The Torah, that the Torah is forever. I love the Torah. I will always obey the Torah. So when the Torah, when Tanakh uses the word Olam Vod, it means then forever and ever for eternity. Okay, but that's not the key. In fact, uh, righteousness 
is far from the wicked because they don't know my Torah. Psalm 119, verse 155. What is most valuable is that we actually have the videotape of the Messianic Age. What do I mean videotape? People can argue before a, a sporting event, which team do they think is going to win? But once the, the final game of the World Series is played, people don't argue about who won because we know who won. We can see it. We can watch it. Even if you weren't there, you can watch the videotape. Tanakh brings into view the messianic age, not once, but all over the prophets. We can see what will happen. We can see the videotape. And when we look at passages in Tanakh, we are told explicitly that the Jews will be keeping all the commandments. An example, you Christians should know these examples. Ezekiel chapter 37, is there a more famous chapter in the prophets than the Valley of Dry Bones, verse 24 and 25, where we are told that the Jews, under the reign of David, my servant, prince, that's Mashiach, all Christians will be Mashiach. The Jews will be keeping all the commandments and statutes and laws explicitly. So it's over. There's no discussion. Moreover, the Torah says you can't add to the Torah nor take away. You can't take away mitzvot. And you can't add to them Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. And if anyone tells you to take away add to him, he's a false prophet. Don't follow that prophet or dreamer of dreams. Why would the Torah say if anyone comes along and says you don't have to keep the mitzvot anymore, don't follow him. If Someone's going to come along and fulfill it for you, which I don't know what that even means. In Ezekiel chapter 11, which Christians love to quote, love to quote Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, but they don't quote Ezekiel 11, verse 19, 20. They only quote Ezekiel 11, verse 19. They only quote Ezekiel 36, verse 26, but not 27. Why? It's, it's a parallel passage, same thing. It's messianic and saying that I'm going to take your heart, which is made out of stone, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Okay? The idea conveyed by the Christian when quoting this passage is that you're going to be able to receive something that you were unwilling to receive, and in their case, they want you to believe that's Jesus. It's precisely the opposite. And that's why they avoid the following verse, which says, and you'll keep my commandments and my laws and my statutes. And we are told in Ezekiel 44, which contains the unused blueprints of the third and final temple, that no one who is uncircumcised, both of the heart and the flesh, will be able to enter the sanctuary, the temple. No one. So we see explicitly in Tanakh that the Jews are going to keep the Torah. And in fact, as we're told in Exodus chapter 31, 16, 17, that, that the Sabbath is forever. It's Baini Uvein B'nai Yisrael. So, and if you say a lifetime, you kind of answer the question, in your own question, the lifetime of who? Of the nation of Israel. There'll never be a time when the Torah won't be observed. And in fact, ki mitzion teze Torah u devar Hashem Yerushalayim. Isaiah chapter 2, ki mitzion teze Torah. This is in the Messianic age. Out of Zion will go forth the Torah. U devar Hashem Yerushalayim, the word of God from Jerusalem. A chapter that's so troubling to the church. It's the most famous Messianic chapter in all of Tanakh. And the New Testament couldn't find any room to quote it. I wonder why. Do you wonder why? 
the most critical feature of how we know the Torah is forever is number one, God says you can't add to the Torah, take away. So if we are told that Jesus says you don't have to keep the Torah anymore, okay, that means he has to be a false prophet. I'm not saying he said that. I'm not. But if he said that, then he's definitely a false prophet because it's also to say that and you're not allowed to add no, or you're allowed to take away from it. Is beverish openly see Deuteronomy chapter thirteen verse one or twelve, the last verse verse thirty two in a Christian Bible. It doesn't make a difference. Why would the Torah say that no one could add or take away from the Torah? No one can add a mitzvah or take away from a mitzvah. So if somebody says to you, you don't have to keep Shabbos anymore. Someone says to you that you you uh, you don't have to keep kosher anymore. Run away! Don't just walk away. Now the Gospels convey that. The Gospels, especially Gospels like Mark, convey that in Mark chapter 7. But the Navi says when Mashiach comes, the Jews will be keeping all the mitzvahs and commandments. Christianity says you don't have to keep the mitzvahs anymore. That's how you know that Christianity is a false religion. Immediately run. Run away. Call up your credit cards. Stop all the payments to the church. Take your children out of these Christian schools. Wash yourself. Touch nothing unclean. Fall before the God of Israel. Say, I renounce all this idolatry. I renounce all this I desire. I am yours. Redeem me, and Hashem will take you. But this, this is the reason to run away. And run away from people who play games with Olam when they want it to mean forever because it helps their theology. They go with it in Micah 5 too, and they go eternity. Right then, they then they like eternity, and when the word bothers them, they change it because they go to First Samuel one twenty two. Doesn't that cause you to think for a moment? Go, what kind of a this religion reeks, reeks, life, run away. Sheikh is coming, my friends. Thank you for your question. Okay, Rabbi, give me one second. Okay, hang on. Sure. Okay, sorry about that. Got phone lines are flooded here. Uh, give me just one second. I got a, eight callers on, and I got to get back to the one who's supposed to be next. So, real quickly, guys, you can, uh, Rabbi, you can mention this to them if you like to on uh, how they can order your books if you don't mind. It's outreachjudaism.org. Outreachjudaism.org. That's where you can. Here's what's really important to do the number one, subscribe. And all that means is you will get all the newsletters about upcoming lectures and programs and you can get let's get biblical volume one and two and subscribe to my channel toby singer and um and tanakh talk very important right. especially during these times very good thank you very much. okay i think sure. we've got it set up and ready to roll call your lab on the air please tell us your name where you call it from yeah this is thorn from benson arizona Welcome, um, thank you for both what, what you do for for us, and uh, I'm glad the rabbi is safe. Um, Christians argue Isaiah 7.14 that Alma can also mean virgin. Can the rabbi explain in detail why Alma was used and not Batula, and why this is a prophecy for that time, not for a future? Now, you mentioned earlier there was something which I thought was kind of interesting, too, and you can feel free to mention it, that... Uh, um there's uh, some resources that really say that you can't trust the rabbis because it literally means that the Alma can mean virgin and, and things like that. So do you want to include that? Right. What you, I'm sorry, say that again? Um, you mentioned on the call earlier that you said there, I think it was a resource or somebody was telling you that the rabbis are wrong and they can't be trusted because of their sources or something. I can't remember what it was. That's okay. Correct. That, that's, that, that's correct. Uh, dodgy sources. Okay. Okay, very All good. Right. Okay, go ahead and hang down to me for answer. Thank you for your call. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the question really should be posed to the Christians. Um, we are told in Matthew and Luke of the 27 books in the Christian Bible, only two of them claim that Jesus was supernaturally conceived. It's striking, incidentally, that the most popular by far Hebrew translation of the Christian Bible was translated by Franz Delich. It's very popular. He, he was a Hebraist of the 19th century, 
really quite a brilliant guy. In fact, his commentary on Tanakh is still widely studied. And it, but his Hebrew translation of the New Testament is very, very popular, and he was really a brilliant Hebraist of the 20th century, of the 19th century, and I, I regret that he didn't do tshuva. Uh, but in any event, when he comes, in, in, I implore you to look up Luke 127. If you can't read Hebrew, then you can't. What am I going to tell you? I don't want you to take my word for it. If you open up his translation of Luke 127, where we are told about the miraculous birth of Jesus to a virgin espoused to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Please look it up. So in 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 Franz Delich's translation, meaning he's translating the Christian Bible into Hebrew. He puts there the word basula. This is not mind-blowing? If that doesn't blow your mind away, I don't know what will. So here's a guy. This was not a liberal Christian. He was a very devout Christian. He was also very committed to converting Jews to Christianity, and that's why he translated the New Testament into Hebrew. Now, Matthew the word virgin in Matthew, he leaves alone as Alma because he has to have Matthew comport with Isaiah 7, 14. But in Luke, when he was not constrained, he used the word basul because he understood very well there's only one way in both biblical and modern Hebrew to convey virginity, and that's the word basula. The word Alma means a young woman. She could be a virgin or might not be a virgin. It's just like the if you understand me, that means you... You're an English speaker, right? So it's just like in English or in any language, if you say woman or, right, that woman might be a virgin, might not be a virgin. There's nothing about the word woman or young woman that conveys virginity. It rather conveys gender and youthfulness. Incidentally, it is young women that have children rather than old women, right? So there's, just as there is nothing in the English language about the word woman that conveys her sexual history, the word Alma, there's nothing about the word Alma that conveys sexual history. And Alma in Tanakh, like Rebecca in the book of Genesis, was a virgin. Not because the word Alma conveys that, because the word Betula conveys that in the same chapter. Conversely, in Proverbs chapter 30, you have King Derch Geva Biyama. This is the way of a man with a woman. And there it's talking about an adulterous woman, a woman who's committing fornication, who's married, and she is like the snake this over a rock, which leaves no trace, like a ship that has passed through the sea, it doesn't leave a trace. After a ship passes through the water, there's a wake behind it, and then the water resolves itself, and you can't tell the ship has ever passed through there. An eagle flying through the sky. Once the eagle flies through the sky, there's no way to look at the sky and detect if an eagle had ever flown there before. A serpent um, carving its way through sand leaves a striking trail, but not over a rock. This is the way of a man with an adulterous woman. Why? She's not a virgin. So when he commits, look at the next verse, Proverbs 30, verse 19, 20. And the word is Alma. It's the same exact word. After he commits fornication with her, she does takes a shower, she wipes her mouth, she washes herself off and says, I have done nothing wrong. And because she isn't a virgin, there's nothing about her, there's no way to tell that anything happened. That's the, that's the book of Proverbs, which means literally is Mishle, which means parables. A mushal is a parable. You follow, you follow, you follow, Kindleach. Moreover, my sweet holy children of Hashem, this will shock you. The sign in Isaiah 7.14, you have to look carefully. 
Because what happened, my friend, I don't know why, I don't know why, but that the devil is a very sharp fellow. <laughs> I am sure so many of you are, are, are people are of faith who believe something, right? Maybe there are some atheists watching this, and I hope I could have some impact on you. But people just don't want to read the Bible. And I, I mean, people who believe it's a holy book, would rather watch a movie than than read the text. No good, no good, wrong. No, people read the context of Isaiah seven fourteen that Matthew quote misquotes in Isaiah. Excuse me, in Matthew one twenty three, is a civil war. The context is an Ephro Syria war in which the northern kingdom of Israel allied with Syria against the southern kingdom of Judah uh, to destroy the kingdom of, that was at that time headed by Ahaz. So Pekach ben Ramayo, who was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, wants to destroy the southern kingdom. That king's name is Ahaz, and he takes Ritzin, the king of Syria, Damascus, and they go together. And Ahaz in the south is a lot of trouble. Isaiah tells him that even though things look bad, you don't have to worry because look at ver verse 15 and 16. Butter and honey will the child eat. Talking about the same child. When he knows to reject bad and choose evil because before he knows to reject bad and choose evil, these two kings that you abhor, namely Pekach ben Ramayohu and Ritzin, those are the two kings, they will be destroyed. They'll be like smoking brands. Um, you know, if you imagine you take a, a, a pieces of wood and light it, right? And then it, they, it burns up. So all you have is ash, right? You're holding a thing, but it's ash, right? You know, there's nothing. You touch it, the whole thing just, nothing, there's nothing left. It's finished, all gone. They'll be destroyed. So the sign is the maturity of the child, that butter and honey. What's butter and honey? What, what do you mean butter and honey? Butter and honey both have to be cultivated. You can't just go, I'm going to, you know, honey, you have to go have bees. You have to cultivate the bees, collect the honey. Butter doesn't just come out of a cow. You have to make butter. These are not foods that people eat under siege. They're not accessible under. When you're under siege, you take, you get milk. If you get milk out of a cow, you're lucky. But you're not cultivating in front of a butter. And the reason why butter was created, old be why did Butter, how did butter come to be? Why did anyone make butter? To be a, butter really was a way of preserving milk when refrigeration wasn't accessible. It means you're thinking long term. So butter st will stick around, but milk goes bad. So that means the child will be free when he, that means the siege will be over when he knows who Jack Ben choose good. So what's the sign, Kinloch? Wake up. What is the sign? Listen, children of Hashem. The sign in Isaiah chapter 7 is verse 15 and 16. The sign is the maturity of the child, that before the child knows, he'll be eating butter and honey when he knows to reject bad and true is good. For before he rejects, for before that, these two kings will be destroyed. The siege will be over. It's so push it. The sign isn't the birth of the child. It's the maturity of the child. How does this apply to Jesus? It has nothing to do with Jesus. There were two kings in the time of Jesus, and Jesus ate butter and honey, and before the two kings were destroyed. What are you talking about? It's nothing that's ripped, ripped, ripped out of context. Ripped out of context. Wake up. Look, I'm telling you now. You keep going to church. Keep going, going, going. Don't. If you want to stay a Christian, don't read Isaiah 7. Don't. 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 If you want to stay a Christian, do not read Tanakh. Don't. In context. In Hebrew. Don't do it. If you really want to remain a member of your church and you want to worship idolatry day and night, don't ever read Isaiah 7.14 in context. Because if you right now will ask Hashem, give me wisdom, please not doctrine, wisdom, and you open up Isaiah 7 and you read it from beginning to end, immediately you'll run away. Not walk, run from the church. 
ripped completely out of context. What are these? This child matures, and there are two kings. What two kings? These two kings are Pekach Berum Mayo and Ritzin, who's the king of the northern kingdom and and Damascus. How do you know? Maybe Singer is a bad person who's an enemy of Christ. Keep believing that until you read Isaiah 7 in context. So if you want to stay a Christian, don't watch this. Watch reruns of Lost in Space, and you'll be lost in space. Moreover, the story is retold again in the beginning of chapter 8. And it's talking about the northern kingdom and, and Syria. And it says there, read Isaiah 8, verse 3 and 4. We're retold now because the mother calls him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That means God is going to protect the Davidic house. And in, in, in Isaiah 8, it says literally, Isaiah is told to be with his wife, to be intimate with his wife. And it says, which means I had sexual intercourse with the prophetess. Yeshayahu's wife was a prophet as well. They were both prophets. The wife calls his name Emmanuel. Isaiah calls his name Quicken the Lude, hasten the, bo hasten the Booty. And Isaiah once knows in 700, it's mind blowing. Vaekrav, that phrase, that word, so the root, karov, means to come close. Okay. But Vaekrav is in the perfect tense and the reflexive tense. And it literally, there's only one other time in all of Tanakh where that exact word in exactly that form exists in Tanakh. And it means sexual intercourse in both cases. In both cases. Because it literally is describing the act of sexual intercourse. It is literally describing penetration. Why would I say, normally Tanakh does not use that word unless it's seeking to describe sexual intercourse. You're familiar with the terms that the Bible usually uses to describe intimacy. He knew her. Now, I know you think that's a, it, that's a euphemism, but it really isn't, but that's, we don't want to go off topic. Why does Yeshayahu Hanovi Hakodesh Vator? Why does Isaiah, the prophet who is holy and pure, a tzaddik, why does he use that word? Why? Wake up, why? Because he knows in 700 years from later, there's going to be a religion, an idolatry that's going to misappropriate Tanakh, and it's going to say that the child was born of virgins. He's no. Sexual intercourse. It's mind blowing. You know how many times the Tanakh tells us that a man knew a woman and they had a child? That's, that's, I'm going to call it now a euphemism. And we're going to say it really isn't a euphemism. And those of you who've um, watched my video on the name of God will know that it's that what it really means. But it, it means to know as in to experience, so you have to watch another video. But only here in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3, and in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 13, those are the only two places in all of Tanakh that that construct is used. Why? To wake you people up in the church to do true. It's ripped out of context, mistranslated. A young woman means nothing more than a young woman. That's all it means. David, King David was called an Elam, which is a masculine version in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 56. Is David also a virgin? It's all so silly. If you want to convey virginity, there's a way to do that in Hebrew. Doesn't make a difference in, in biblical Hebrew that's 3,000 years old or modern Hebrew, Betula. No other way to say it. Deuteronomy 22, a woman is slandered. And he and and he, he found out that she wasn't the virgin. That's the context. So it has to use that word. The only two places in Tanakh. So the church alters it. And don't let anyone tell you about Septuagints. Don't do it. I'm telling you now. You're going to go back to your pastor. You're going to get a whole speech about what in the Septuagint. It says part of the nose. When everyone, anyone brings up Septuagint, stop him. Stop him. 
It's a scam. Don't let anyone tell you about Parthenos. Tanakh was written in Hebrew. The church is going to alter the Hebrew in a Greek translation. Ah, but the rabbis before Christ translated Isaiah. No, they didn't. They only translated the five books of Moses. The 72 learned men who translate the original Septuagint, now called the Proto-Septuagint, which is lost, was destroyed in the, in, the, in the Alexandrian library. Destroyed. That doesn't exist anymore. What we have today is a Christian product. So don't, and I, I see professors repeating this. I see people, they're not PhDs in Hebrew, but, you know, people who shouldn't, they, they didn't. It's all baloney. If you are receptive to the notion that the Septuagint was translated by 72 rabbis, and we accept this putative translation over the original, then you deserve Christianity. Then you and Christianity, it's a perfect match. If you think that a translation is superior to an original, what am I going to say to you? Then there's nothing I could say to you. You were taught, you know that you were told by the church and its missionaries that it is the Hebrew that we believe in as the word of God. And it was Hebrew that was conveyed to the prophets of Israel. And it's the original Hebrew that we trust in. So don't let anyone talk to us too. Because if they start talking Septuagint, you're gone. The original Septuagint was only the five books of Moses. It was did, Now later on, subsequently, after 250 BCE, subsequently many other people would translate the Bible into Greek. Many, over and over and over again. The one we have today comes out of the hands of origin. Don't let anyone talk to you about Septuagint. If they do, you're gone. You don't have a chance. Mm. Anyways, thank you for your question. Well, that was thorough. Thank you, Rabbi, for that. Yes. All right. Uh, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hi, this is Jesse from Brooklyn. Hey, Jesse, welcome. Um, hi, thanks. Uh, glad to see you safe, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, so, now, I was looking at Proverbs um, 34, and as you just said, these are parables. And um, this appears to me to say that basically God can't have a child or a son, rather. Um, we know God can have a begotten son, like David. Um, but this, this, to me, this means that God can't have a son, basically. There is no such thing as Proverbs 34. There, maybe it's a, ver maybe no, it's a verse 34 or something yeah, yeah, Proverbs 30, verse 4, I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. Oh, sure, 34. sure, okay. 34, there you go, not 34, gotcha, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, so, right. Go ahead with your question. Your oh, so d does this mean God can't have a son? Because it's, it's obviously a rhetorical question um, at the end of this is, what is his name and what is the name of his son? Ah, uh, right, know? right. And verse yeah. 5 now, you know, obviously doesn't give an answer, so we know this is rhetorical. And being that, that this was written, you know, before Jesus was born, um, the people at the time would have to know what this means if it's a rhetorical. And to me, when I read this in, in context, it means that God, no, no one who can have a son can accomplish all these aforementioned feats that are listed prior to that question. Sweetheart, listen to me. The word son in Proverbs appears more frequently, my son, than any other book in the entire Bible. Okay. Mm -hmm. It appears more than 20 times, my son, my son, my son. What is this my son, God's son, all over Proverbs? Okay, so that's what's key. Key is to know the context of Proverbs. Thank you for your Go ahead question. and hang them down to your answer. Thank you, Holly. All right. I, I don't like to. Did you want to elaborate on that or do you want to? Oh, yes, very much. Very, okay, great. Yes. <laughs> okay, take it away. Yes, okay. I don't, I don't mean to embarrass anyone. I'm very happy, those of you who like me and mm -hmm. look to my teachings for edification. I'm trying to persuade you to not rely on me and to go back to the original. 
the, the, none of the things I'm sharing with you are novel or insightful or I'm some genius with some photographic. It's, I, I don't, it's, 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 I like to be liked and I like that those who are my enemies hate me, but really it's very, very important, Kindler, children who are born from above, not from below, to go back to Tanakh. So you're right, my sweet brother. A proverb is a book of parables. And my son, we are introduced to my son, Shema Bini Musar Avicho. Listen, my son, to the rebuke of your father, and do not abandon the Torah of your mother. This word, this refrain, my son, is interlocked with wisdom, the one who is the true follower of the true God. That's my son. And it's, it appears this word, bini, is just all over Proverbs. It's the wisdom the one who's able to see, and that's why this is called wisdom literature. It's a different kind of book. Wisdom, you could see it walking down the street. Wisdom, it's edification, breathed by Hashem and given to us. If you know who Hashem is, you know who my son is, the wisdom, and it's everywhere. I think the word appears. I think the word appears 21 times in the book of Proverbs. I think. The point is it appears there a lot. Okay. So the wisdom found in Proverbs is what Hashem imbues to his son. Who is God's son in the Bible? Who? It's those who follow him, those who he called out of Egypt. Firstborn son, Exodus 4, 22, Israel. Those who are the followers of the children of Israel. Hosea 11, 1. What a nice world we would live in if... Matthew had not tampered with that pericope in Matthew 2.15. We'd live in a different kind of world, wouldn't it? That's why, my dear brothers and sisters, I implore you, open Tanakh and study it. Study it carefully. If you go, if you go to a passage in the middle of a book, and you haven't read the verses that introduce it, you, there could be a, a little bit of trouble. And that's always where everyone gets into trouble. Always, always. Now, there are other books like um, that, are, that are not using this sort of poetry that are prosaic, using standard prose. Well, you could. I wanted to look up the laws of clean and unclean animals, just what species are they. You could look up Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11, is there's no poetry in that chapter. It's the laws of what you can eat and what you can't eat, what animals are clean and unclean. Those are the context is not as determinative. But in Isaiah, Isaiah, with the exception, I don't know, five or six chapters, Isaiah 66 chapters. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say six. So that means 90% of Isaiah is poetry, meaning dense language that you can only unpack if you read the context and the chapters that introduce it, or else you just don't have a chance. And I would tell you this, that if you don't read Proverbs in context of 29 chapters that introduce. If you read Proverbs from the beginning, so we're introduced to Hashem's son right from the get go, right from, from the beginning. That was Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. And my son, my son continues it. And verse 10, verse, it's, it's the one who is imbued with the wisdom, who's following in the proper way. So, 
who has all these powers described in Proverbs 30? What's his name? And what is his son's name? It's the one who is my son all over leading up to Proverbs chapter 30, right? It's really very simple. Don't let the church misguide you. Don't let them do it. Read it, text, in context. Thank you for your right question. On. Very good. All right, moving on to our next caller. You're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hello, Rabbi. My name is Yaakov. I'm calling from right outside Yerushalayim. Welcome. Um, my question is about Hosea 14. <laughs> that at one point they had a discussion with someone who affiliates himself with the Jews for Jesus. And when something had come up about the temple no longer being here, and I, as an innocent uh, yeshiva guy, said, Unashama Farm Sasainu means that if you talk about the sacrifices, if you brought it. And his response, loosely translated, was that's not the plain meaning of the verse. But the plain meaning of the verse seemingly would be that the main thing is repentance and not offerings. And then, and then with that, you understand why in the beginning of Isaiah, when he says, why do I need all sacrifices? So how did the church manage to twist it into, uh, you don't have sacrifices, the only thing that could help you? How did that shift happen? If it seemingly seems so clear from so many places that tshuva is the main thing and not the karbanas. My dear brother, you walk the streets of Israel and you see people smoking a cigarette. Yes, I'm sure you do. And you ask yourself yeah. a question. How do these people smoke cigarettes when it says plainly on the package that smoking kills? How? Hmm, that's funny. What's the answer? What's the answer? You tell me the answer. Because they love cigarettes. And they want to feel good. That's the reason people smoke. Not because they don't know. They want their idolatry. They want the feeling of the nicotine delivers. That's what they want. That's the reason why people do this. The same book. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I can go ahead and hang up now and continue for your answer. Thanks. The same book, if they would only read the same book. I'm not going to go ahead and know the book. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Mamish says that, Beferish. Beferish. Openly. The knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. They don't want it. And when you speak to missionaries, it's like speaking to people who are smoking a cigarette. Now, ordinarily, when you pass people on the street who are smoking a cigarette, I assume you don't always approach them. You just don't, right? But if you get into a conversation, you have me friendly, afterwards you feel like you want to mention, like, why do you smoke? You ever, you ever listen to these answers? Why do you smoke? Pathetic. I can't even begin, right? And sm they know it kills. Not only does smoking kill them, the, the worst possible death that people can experience is the death that comes from diseases caused by smoking. The worst. The die of emphysema is horrible. And the a most amazing thing is that people can quit smoking, and within a few years, a person's body will repair itself. Well, what a wonderful thing. There are people who used to smoke, and they quit. And then they live a long life. You could do tshuva, but people want their cigarettes. Why? Because cigarettes make people feel good. For sure, I'm sure of it. They feel great. I'm sure of it. But it feels great now. The Torah is not saying that other religions don't make you feel good. They do. But eventually the Torah says this behavior will kill you. So they could say these things, but it's not what Hosea says. People always love ritual. Always did. They always thought that the sacrificial system could save them because people love incantations. They really love it. And they think that the ritual is more important than the way you behave. It's a very big mistake. And Micah 6, 6 through 8, I would, Hosea and Micha lived at the exact same time. They were contemporaries, as was Isaiah. 
Micha 6 said, why do you come for the Lord and with Most High and bring him burnt offering? Is the God as pleased with Rams as he is with, with justice? And he says, no, he doesn't want your firstborn. He doesn't want it. He does not want it. Jeremiah, in a speech that almost got him killed, he was almost assassinated for his speech that he conveyed in Jeremiah 7 and 8. Almost killed. Almost killed for it. Jeremiah was almost killed a few times. A black slave saved him. Jer right here, right here in Yishalayim, he was almost, almost killed. And he... He's, the people are saying, oh, we have sacrifices. It'll save us. And Jeremiah excoriates them. He says, where did you get stupid teachings from? And when, when I took it, when did I even tell you about sacrifices? Please read Jeremiah 7, verse 21. Stop screaming the temple. People like it. They, they like rituals. They have all kinds of amulets. They have red strings tied to their wrists. And they, they miss the essence of it. They miss, it's not that a sacrifice that is brought with love from a pure and contrite heart, that God will not despise, see Psalm 51. It's like a person is married. Of course it's very good to bring your wife chocolates. It's very good to remember your anniversary and her birthday. But if you come home stinking from another woman's perfume, and your shirt is marked with another woman's lipstick, she's not interested in your offerings. She's not interested in your chocolates. These commandments, these mitzvot of offerings, and the word carbon means an offering. It doesn't mean sacrifice. It's the wrong word. That English word is, is a Christian word. It's an English word, but it, it's a Christian source. Of course, these carbonas are very delicious when they are offerings that are, are, that are righteousness, offerings of righteousness. See Psalm 51. Otherwise, God doesn't want it. And who better to comment on this than David, King David? Why? Because he did a terrible thing. He made a terrible error. Error is a horrible sin. Nathan confronted him with the famous, the famous juridical parable. And David said two words, Chatasi Lashem, I simply for the Lord and, and Nathan forgave him. Nathan can't do anything. Nathan said, the Lord forgave you. No sacrifice, no authoring, nothing. David writes about this. In Psalm 40, he says that God doesn't want sacrifice, he wants, but Oznayim Karisali, my ears you have ever opened for me, burnt offerings and offerings thou hast not required. And you can depend on the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 5 to change it. How do you change it? David says in Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7, it was 7 and 8 in the Christian Bible, that sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but my ears you have opened for me. Mamish says, did not desire, but my ears, oznayim korisoli, my ears you have opened, right? So what does the Christian Bible do? It misquotes it. And in Hebrews, please look it up. Please, please, please. Just open up two browsers, okay? So you got one here, Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7, or 7 and 8, depending if it's a Jewish or Christian Bible. And here, open up Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. And let's go back and forth. And ask yourself, is Rabbi Singer saying these things because he has an unfavorable view of Christianity and he's lying? Or is he telling the truth? And if, he's, and if what I'm saying is true, if Hebrews 10, 5 does not quote the text properly. It's not that it's properly. It changes it. A body I prepared for me? There's nowhere it says body prepared for me. So David, David is saying him. Hosea is speaking to both the southern and the northern kingdom. You can see that from the beginning of Hosea who he's addressing. So Hosea very much had on his hands a northern kingdom. He had them in view. And he's saying, look, Israel, you have stumbled in your iniquity. You have sinned. He doesn't say that one day Jesus will die for your sins. He says, take with you words, words. 
please look it up for yourself. It's Hosea chapter 14, verse 2 or 3, depending on the Jewish Christian Bible. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say, forgive our iniquity and teach us the good way. Mamish says that. And let us render for bulls the offering of lips prayer. It means you could daven, you could pray instead of bring a carbon. And this would have been a very important thing for people in the North Air, so they knew that they could pray. And the people say it all, all the time, this is rabbinic Judaism. I debated the head of Jews for Jesus years ago. And he said that what I'm saying is rabbinic Judaism. It's a debate I had with Jan Moskowitz, head of Jews for Jesus at the time. He's dead now. And he said, I'm introducing rabbinic Judaism. Really? Hosea is rabbinic Judaism? If Hosea is rabbinic Judaism, then Hosea is my chief rabbi. It's true. This is rabbinic Judaism. And Hosea and Isaiah and Micha and Amos, all contemporaries, they're my rabbis. Right? And this stuff you'll even hear. I'm telling you now, my friends, you'll hear it from professors in colleges. And they don't, they don't know what they're talking about. They have no clue what they're talking about. No idea. Why? Because they're evil? No. This is what their professor taught them. And they regurgitate it. They read this in books. Why do people read They like, would rather read a book written by a professor from Duke University than a book written by the prophet of Israel. And I don't know what it is. I don't know why people have this. The eight Sahara, the evil inclination does this. Don't read it. Don't read it. Read a book. Go to Rabbi Google, Pastor Google. That's what the people go to. They go to Pastor Google. Why not the word of Hashem? They don't want to. Why? Because the Sultan tells them don't read the original. And people get themselves in all kinds of trouble. And that's why people, even though they see the evidence all around them, you know how much evidence there is that smoking kills? You know how much? You know how many carcinogens there are in a cigarette? Hundreds, not one, hundreds. People see it and remind it constantly, and they smoke. And you ask them, why do you smoke? They don't say, I want to kill myself. Why do you smoke? And they give you some pathetic, and this is the answer you get from Jews for Jesus. It's time to wake up. Thank you for your question. All right, very good. All right, moving on to the next caller. Caller, you are live on the air, and please tell us your name and where you're calling from. I have to take you off hold. Call your live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Yeah, my name is um, Bob. I'm calling from Rochester, New York. Bob, welcome. Go right ahead with your question, sir. Yeah, my question was um, <laughs> Psalm 110 is being quoted in um, Matthew 22, 41 through 46. And um, the Pharisees asked Jesus, um, or he asked the Pharisees, what do you think of the Christ? And, and they said, you know, he's the son of David. And then <clears throat> then he said, oh, how could David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make these, thy enemies a footstool. And then Jesus said, if David called him Lord, how is he his son? And then Jesus, when he quoted it, he seems to be saying, I could be misunderstanding it, but he seems to be saying, if the Messiah is divine, he cannot be the descendant of King David. So I'm not sure if that's the right way to interpret Matthew 22. But that's what he, that's what Jesus seems to be saying. Okay. Rabbi, you clear? Right. Yeah, uh, sure. Okay. All right. Go ahead and hang up now. Thank you so much for your call, Bob. Take care. All right. Uh, Thanks. Bye. Hey, Bob, I, I don't know if you see you hung up on him. I sure. did. I did. Sorry about that. Uh, but just for the callers out there, we had a lot of callers. If you don't get in today, which most yeah, of you won't, so good. call back it's next so week because good. good questions out there. Just be sure to call again next week. This yeah. might be our last topic. We'll see. Take it away, Rabbi. So this is the um, probably the second most quoted verse in all of Tanakh in the, by the Christian Bible. Christian Bible quotes this a lot. It comes up a lot. I, well, let's do an experiment together. Let's open up Matthew 22, verse 44. Let's do that. Let's do it together. Let's do the forensics on this. I think it's a good idea. Let's have fun. So we open up Matthew 22. I'll actually give you a moment. I want you to see this. I want you to understand that I don't care what translation you I use. I will help you guys. I'll put it on your screen I for you. I want you to look it up. 
Matthew 22, 44. It's not the only place. It's, it's quoted quite a bit in the Christian Bible, but we'll do that. Okay. So Matthew 22, 44 says, In any Christian Bible, the Lord said to my Lord. You see that? The Lord said to my Lord. Uh, now, it was the opening in NIV. They're identical. If you're opening a King James, you have to have a sharp I. The first Lord will be all uppercase, second Lord, only capital L-O-R-D. The point is they're the same. The point is they're the same. So therefore, the Lord, and that's a God, capital L, not lowercase L, said to my Lord. Okay. So if this is what's conveyed in Matthew, if the, the, the Pharisees are being challenged here, the Jews are being challenged here. If King David is speaking, after all, he's now you have to buy into his head game. So King David, we are told, is the author. This is very terrible. So if David, these Jews are being said that the Lord God said to my Lord, who then is David's Lord? It can only be, the point is, that can only be Christ. Sit at my right hand to make your enemies unfruitful. You got it? So David, we are told, is speaking. And David is saying, the Lord God spoke to my Lord. And it's capital L. Lord. God. It's in the Greek. I mean, the translator in, in the NIV is translating it fine. The New Revised Standard, translating it fine. Because the Greek is God. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Now, my friends, you you you're drowning in the water, and it's not an ocean. An ocean, you could tread water for a long time, and the lake, fresh water, fresh water. It's very hard to keep yourself from drowning because it's not buoyant. So you're drowning drowning unless you go back to the original psalm so if you go back if you don't read hebrew you're fried fried you're finished so as it turns out the hebrew doesn't reflect this at all the hebrew says david mizmor nom hashem la so the first word the first lord which is the fourth word david mizmor nom Hashem. So there it's Yud K Vav K. It's the Tetragrammaton. It's the Shem Hashem. It's the uneffable name of God, which only can mean HaKodesh Baruch Hu. Only. And then the next word, that means the fifth Hebrew word. So if you can't, let's say you can't read Hebrew, a stitch of Hebrew. So remember, Hebrew is from right to left. English is from left to right, though, in case you don't know. So Psalm 110, verse 1, it's really, if you don't read Hebrew, if you don't read Hebrew, just open up your browser to Psalm 110, verse 1. That's all you need to do. And look at the fourth word. It's Yud, and then a He, then a Vav, then a He. We don't ever say that name. If someone tells you to say it, don't listen to them. But you see that word. That's the name of Hashem. Okay? It's called the Shem Hashem, the name of God, the ineffable. That's the Tetragrammaton. Now go to the fifth word. Let's say you can't read a stitch of Hebrew, but you could see shapes because the fifth word is La Adoni. It's totally different. It has five letters in it. Now, how odd in the Christian Bibles, the word is the same, Lord and Lord. And in the Hebrew Bible, it's two entirely different words. If you live in Eretz Israel, if you live in the Holy Land, you know exactly what Adoni means. Why? Because Adoni means, it technically means my master. Okay? But in Israel, it's conversational Hebrew. Was it Adoni, Adoni, Adoni? Which means... Doesn't mean if you're working, if you're going to the guy in the bakery and you want to order a bread, you call him Adoni. What you do? You say, Adoni, please. 
Adoni means it means my man, but it just doesn't mean God. It's a way of just respectful. It's not falling on the floor. Adoni. There are people who are wicked in the Bible who someone addresses as Adoni. It the one thing about Adoni is it does not mean Hashem ever, ever. Now be careful. You could change the vowels around, and then it can mean God or might not. But Adoni never means it. Now, here's the question. People go, oh, it's Masoretic text. Don't let them play games ahead. Why does the word Adoni, why is that word translated as Lord, capital L, there, but everywhere else with that exact word, with that exact composition, with that exact, everywhere else it's lowercase l. I want to know the answer. I want an answer now. I want to know why the scam, why the fake, why are you playing with me? Why are you doing this to me? Genesis 24, verse 56, as an example, describing the marriage of Yitzchak and Rivka. Has it end? Shalchuni le... Elcho la Adoni, send me away so I can go to my master. Why? Why do all all the King Jameses, all the Christy Bibles there find the word master lowercase m or lowercase l or lowercase lowercase? It's the same exact word, exact same word. If you don't want to look it up because you like being a Christian, then why are you watching this? Go, I know Christianity, you feel better. You don't want to kill yourself anymore. You stop smoking. Jesus spoke to you. Fine. If that's your, it just feels, don't listen to me. Don't. If you look it up, so the church has altered the text. Why? Because they want you to think they're the same. It's going to get darker. We're not done yet. You want to go we'll go darker. Who is speaking here? So this is, we're going to have fun now. We're going to have fun. If you read Hebrew, you'll see it immediately. And if you don't read Hebrew, you'll see it if you could just recognize the shapes of letters. And I think for every person listening to my voice right now, watching me right now, this will be new to you. So what is like the most famous psalm? It may be the Lord is my shepherd. Okay. So let's do that for a moment. So this is hot. This is pure heat. Pure heat. I'm going to give you a moment to open up Psalm 23 verse 1 on one browser and Psalm 110 verse 1 on another browser. Why? Because you want to see the word of Hashem. How does Psalm 23 begin? Mizmor le David, a song of David, Hashem roi, the Lord is my God, is my shepherd, lo yechzer, and therefore I don't lack anything. Okay, you know this one. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Okay? Now, here's, we're going to watch this, okay? So watch what's going to happen. Listen. Listen, and we're going high, very high. This is how a child of Hashem gets high, doing this. You have to watch carefully. Watch very carefully. So again, how does this chapter begin? Mizmor Ludovid. What does Mizmor Ludovid mean? A song of David. A song of David. So David is the author. He composed it. Mizmor le David, which can mean either a song to David or a song of It means a song of David. It means David is speaking. And in fact, this chapter, as the chapters that introduce it, David, King David is the author. So it's a song, a pericope of David. Okay? He composes a song of David. Okay, look very carefully at Psalm 110, verse 1, 
And I would like you to tell me, how is it different? You got it. It's the exact reverse. Psalm 110 begins with, Ludovid Mizmor. It reverses it. I never noticed that before. Now, look at the translations. Do they reverse it too? No, they don't. Trouble. What is the difference, my friends, between Mizmor Ludovid, Psalm 23, and Ludovid Mizmor? Now, those of you who speak Hebrew know exactly what the difference is. They're reversed. What does that convey? Because you ain't going to find out in the translation. They, for some reason, don't think there's a reason, there is any reason at all to convey this reversal. What is that reversal? One is Mizmor Ludovid, the most famous psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Holy smokes, that's a very holy psalm. That's a very famous psalm. And Psalm 110 doesn't say Mizmor Ludovid, but rather Ludovid Mizmor. What is Ludovid Mizmor? I just reversed it. You won't know from your King James. Ludovid Mizmor means to David a song. Whoa. That means who is singing this? Not David. It's not Mizmor Ludovid, a song of David. So what is conveyed in Matthew 22 is a lie. And the lie is fueled by ignoring this. Mizmor Ludovid means a song of David. Means David is the author. But Lidovid Mizmor means to David. Who are the singers in the Beis HaMikdosh? The Levim, the Levites, the great-grandchildren of Levi, the son of, the son of Jacob. I'm a descendant of Levi. The, the singers in the Beis Hamigdosh, those who are reciting this psalm, this is not the only psalm, but it's rare. The people in the Beis Hamigdosh are singing this aloud to David. Not David singing it. So they're saying, the Lord said to my master, which means Hashem said to my master, if you're singing in the Beis Hamigdosh, who is your master? Your master is an Adoni. He's not God. He's David. So the Lord, God, said to my master, David. David, who is the one who literally, he, the Sukkot David, he is the one who repairs the materials for the base of Amigdash. He wanted to build it. He couldn't. What reason? Not important here. David, David, David. So, Ludovid Mizma means to David a song, a song. That means the Levites are singing this in the base of Mikdash to David, and then the Lord said to my master, that's David, sit at my right hand. And then if you look at the chapter, it's a really tiny chapter. What is the chapter about? Well, the chapter is about defeating your enemies. My gosh, I mean, how it's, what is it? Seven passages. It's that Hashem will take all your enemies and place them under your feet. You will destroy them. Exactly the promise that God made a thousand years earlier to Abraham through Malkit Tzedek, who is Shem. The context in Genesis 14 is identical. Abraham defeated the four kings. And he is, please read it for yourself. He's promised that your enemies ultimately will be defeated by you, through you. And that's passed on to David. And David defeated enemies, and that will continue on forever until Mashiach. That ultimately destroyed. So, now my friends, you know what this is like? You know what it's like? You know, you, you go on, you can watch a magician. It does a trick, right? You go, how did he do that? Now, you know, he's not really doing magic, but the slide of hand. And then they tell you how the trick is done. And, and then what do you go? You go, oh, that was stupid. Like, why didn't I see that? <laughs> it's all about deflection. It's all about misdirection. That's how m magic tricks are done. The difference between the magician on, in Las Vegas and the churches that the magician admits that these are illusions. 
that these are accomplished through misdirection. Only well, he's a liar, but magicians will tell you they're not doing any. They're not violating the laws of physics, not really sawing a lady in half. And we watch it, not that I do, but it, it's interesting because how did he fool me? The, difference, the only difference between the magician is the magician's an honest man. And he's saying this is a show of illusions, illusions. And the Christian Bible says, no, we're really doing magic. But they're shakaronim. They're liars. They're fakers. So how is this accomplished? How is this scam accomplished? Number one, don't show in Matthew 22 that there's a difference between Lord and Lord. Don't show what it actually what's going on in a Psalm 110. And there's a big game you can play here because then listen carefully. You need to know this. This is not conventional. We in the 21st century, when we refer to God, when we say God, we only mean God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Be very careful with this. In Tanakh. Angels who represent the will of God, who carry out the will of God, prophets who carry out the will of God, judges who convey the word of God are called God. If you're not familiar with this, you're in trouble, big trouble. In Exodus 21 and 22, when right after, that's right after the Ten Commandments, we're told that if you have a problem, take it to the judges. It really says God. Okay? Now, this distinction between how we speak today, none of us would ever call anything but God, God. We would never refer to an angel as God, but the Bible does. When Jacob wrestled with God, he really wrestled with an angel. What do you mean? It doesn't say it in Genesis, but it says it in Hosea chapter 12, verse 4, explicitly. So it is this different, this chasm in the way what is conventional for us to speak and the way Tanakh speaks, that can be exploited, can be weaponized by the church, and they do, in order to get you to commit apostasy and to get baptized and to get into the church. So all you have to do is mistranslate La Doni as Lord, capital L-O-R-D, switch, ignore that it's not Mizmar Lodovid, but Lodovid Mizmar, playing Pooh, you're in the church. You're persuaded. And it feels good. And it feels so good. And so he said, don't go near it. Stay away from it. And Psalm 110 is about David defeating his enemies. And it is a Davidic dynasty. And the one thing Jesus didn't do, one of many things he didn't do, was he didn't defeat any enemies. So if you want to say he's talking about Mashiach, be my guest, then it's another proof that Jesus can't be the Messiah. I know second coming. All the fake messiahs, second coming. That's what saves them. My friends, go back to the original. The church is a magician. It's a bad magician. It's not a a Las Vegas magician. This is a five-year-old doing magic tricks. So easy. But you have to look. You have to watch. Keep your eyes open. How? Listen to everybody. Say, oh, forget me. Go back to the original. Thank you for your thoughtful question. Very good, Rabbi. And it looks like that's going to wrap us up today. So I appreciate all you guys tuning in. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on your notifications so you'll get everything that comes through. Um, and again, don't forget to check out Rabbi Singer's books, two-volume books at alwaysjudaism.org. Uh, and the uh, email address there for any other questions that can't come through the show will be tobiasinger1 at aol.com. So uh, once again, you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day, Rabbi. Thank you. And we're Hashem willing. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Peace out, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom.
חשוב מכל חשוב והכרחי להיות ביחד. איפוק זו העוצמה, ויתור זו הגדולה, השאיפה.